Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Open Doc Lab public lecture. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce Lori Lande. She's an interdisciplinary teacher, scholar, and artist whose creative and critical work explores themes of transformation in audiovisual cultural forms, technologies, and perception. She's a professor of visual culture and new media at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, she teaches courses such as digital narrative theory and practice, art and virtual reality, dance and technology lab, and the language of film. She's the author of two books, I Love Lucy and Madcap Screwballs and Con Women, The Female Trickster in American Culture. She's also written numerous articles about topics including Minecraft, Lego, virtual subjectivity, digital narrative, uh, silent films, and gender and comedy. Uh, her new media art has been exhibited all over the world, um, including the Boston Science Fiction Film Festival, Cyberfest in Russia, uh, On the Wall Dance Film Series in Berlin, um, and many other places. She's won awards such as the Best of Show and People's Choice Awards at the New Media Consortium Summer Conference Art Show, Best Machinimatography Award um, at the International Society for Technology and Education, and many other awards. Her interactive new media art installation, Shadow Loop, was included in the Avatars exhibit at the Nave Gallery in Somerville in 2019. Today, she's going to talk to us about mixed reality online virtual performances, live performances, that is, and I'll let her take it from there. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm delighted that, you know, we figured out all these ways of continuing to connect with each other and um, uh, it's, a, it's appropriate, I think, probably for all of our work <laughs> to be thinking about the ways that technology uh, mediates, um, which of course means that it uh, is a way of connecting and also the ways that it comes between. And that really is uh, the topic of, that I'm gonna discuss today. So I'm going to share my screen, push that share button, and then also the present. There we go. And um, as you can see, the title of my uh, comments today is, is Pivot, Mixed Reality Live Performance Online, right? And so um, what I thought I would, would uh, touch on today is uh, the project that I've been working on at Berkeley College of Music here in Boston that, um, that was originally supposed to be a project that has, um, uh, was it's an experimental combination of performance, music, movement, and gaming, right? So right there, it's like a weird thing to try to pull off <laughs> anyway, right? But beyond that, it um, of course has been uh, like, you know, like incredibly complicated and challenged by uh, the current pandemic situation where we lost the uh, in-person component. The idea was that we were going to have like a live performance that was um, uh, taking place like in an installation, in like a intermedial installation. And we were just getting to the point where, um, where uh, we were talking about how we were gonna do the wall that was going to be controlled by connects and how people were gonna control those with movement in the space. And uh, that's, when, um, that's when we realized that we would not be doing anything in any space whatsoever and would need to move our mixed reality live performance online. So we had to shift from the in-person to the online and really rethink what aspects of our project that were going to be physical could we continue to have uh, in a virtual space. So some people um, involved with the project, which is the electronic production and design department, there's a class that uh, runs this project. And um, it's part of a collaboration with Berkeley's ambassador for artistry in 
education, who is Nona Hendricks, who's a fantastic person uh, and um, uh, innovator. She's been on the cutting edge of technology and music for decades. And uh, I personally um, really experienced a transformation in how I perceived where sound could come from in her performance when I first saw her in her audio tutu perform at Symphony Hall. And uh, the sound, she has like a plexiglass clear um, like, like skirt tutu that uh, comes out and her iPod was in there and also the speakers. So wherever she was, the sound came out of. And that was, I don't know, maybe eight, eight years ago, I think was when that performance was. And as I say, it uh, you know, changed my understanding of what could happen in, in a performance space and what a performer could do. And uh, so it's a, a, just a, a constant uh, delight and uh, you know, like privilege to be able to work with her on this project. So I'm gonna to talk today about the goals, challenges, potential solutions, our pivots. I've been pivoting so much. I feel like I'm just like twirling and twirling and twirling and never, never get to stay still. <laughs> but our performance is gonna be like on May 10th, May 10th, I think is what we've actually decided on. So um, I guess I am gonna, it, it, we are actually at a point where we are staying, uh, staying, well, not still, but we've, you know, really narrowed our pivoting <laughs> to a very, very tight uh, circle rather than like this big kind of tornado cyclone kind of thing that it seemed like uh, was going on. We've um, had to rely on a lot of improvisation. And uh, of course, um, when you're working with a team of people and uh, different people are coming from different uh, areas, different disciplines, um, and different, uh, you know, areas of expertise. There have been issues around communication that, um, uh, you know, are only exacerbated by not being able to be physically in the same place at the same time and just be like, hey, let me show you this or watch this or, you know, hey, just do this <laughs> or watch me do this, you know. So um, we've been trying to create presence however we can in both the, uh, uh, the production process and also in thinking about what this experience is going to be. So all of this is in, in the, uh, the context of what was supposed to be happening this semester for me, which is that um, we, uh, we have a, a set of uh, a classroom set or a set size of, of Oculus Quest size for my classes. Um, at uh, Berkeley in our immersive tech lab. I know a few of you uh, who I saw here have uh, been, been to our space or know it very, very well. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so um, all my classes, my, my, the three courses I'm teaching uh, this semester and um, uh, this project were all going to be, you know, very heavily focused on um, you know, using Oculus Quest for this kind of like multiplayer uh, kind of uh, a game that we are also building as like a standalone game. But that game has become like the container for the whole performance. We are also using the Mimu gloves, which uh, Image and Heap has been the leading force behind that. Nona Hendricks also uses them. Ariana Grande uh, used them in uh, one of her really big, big stadium tours. And uh, Kelly Snook was the, the like, lead tech person for that um, and her uh, engineer, her programmer. And um, so that's something that we've been trying to do that works with uh, OSC, so that works over the internet. <laughs> so we're continuing to do that, but combining the hands of the gloves and the hands for Oculus Quest. And also one of the things that I hope that we'll be talking about um, uh, once I stopped, once I stop talking and you all can start talking, is um, how uh, we are not able to really use the quests, uh, not only because um, you know, most of them are, are uh, still, you know, like in our, our lab, but, but also because um, we do not have pervasive adoption of, uh, you know, this technology of immersive uh, devices. And so we are using the Oculus Quest for 
who we're calling the characters, the performers. So that's, you know, like Nona, me, this is Alyssa Cardone, my co-teacher in a dance and technology lab that we teach at uh, Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. And um, uh, a few other people, um, including Chagall, who maybe some of you know, is just one of the most exciting performers who using uh, technology and music and movement who performs with the Mimu gloves and also um, like a full body uh, motion capture suit. So in terms of goals, well, we always wanted to do something, or at least I always wanted to do something that had to do with uh, intermedial perceptions, with intermedia. And the really imp important idea behind intermedia is that the audience um, creates meaning from what is in between the media. It's not just like multimedia, it's not transmedia, but this idea that when we combine the mediums in this way, that, um, that we have something that uh, uh, is about perception and is about the audience's perception. Right, so we start thinking about um, about uh, what is the relationship between the spectator and the performer. Um, when we're thinking about gaming, which is something that you know you'll see is not here, like in this diagram. When often when people are bringing this forward, some of this uh, like theoretical material forward from um, like theater and moving into immersive theater, uh, there is a game element, but it's still kind of like theater performance focused. But um, in thinking about it being a game and something that the spectators aren't only spectators who are like participating by making meaning, but are also participating by having agency by, uh, which is like super limited in our project as we've like continued to develop it, but, um, but uh, has to do with, um, the perception of what they can influence. And uh, I'll talk more specifically about that. So in terms of some of, some of the inspirations, um, these are, are uh, uh, two of the, the projects that I've been following and really interested in. I don't know if anybody from uh, Boston was able to go to Meme, a ballet for the internet that was at the ICA, the Institute for Contemporary Art in Boston uh, last year. But that's what this picture is of, and that's the elevator at the ICA. And people are being wheeled into the elevator because the chairs that we were sitting in um, just moments before this in the performance hall where you think you're gonna sit there and watch a performance like you, know, you always do had just been taken and like lurched backwards and and uh, start to be wheeled around because the the performance uh, was actually staged throughout the uh, museum which is full of glass big huge glass windows and is just really a spectacular uh, space um, I think I'll, I'll see as I'm talking about that I'll show you this this one first now um, I know you're now looking at YouTube and um, this, uh, I'm gonna pick this up right about here. And you see video, and I, I'm not playing the sound on purpose. You see video of the, the audience members being moved around. Here's their plan of how to move the audience members around. And um, they have uh, different groups of people. They were very different styles. It was a little bit like, you know, it's, it's a story ballet about the internet. So the idea was uh, that there are all these different things happening in, on different websites and different styles, some which are kind of more webcam uh, like and some which are more like movies. Um, let's, uh, you know, see, this is, this, is a, this is about like the making of, but it also has some of the best uh, footage that I've seen other than I had some video that I, I took as well, but you know, it's all of me being tilted backwards. <laughs> so, you know, some of it is the idea of like gaming, um, what happens when you are scrolling through, moving through spaces. And uh, one of the things that was most interesting to me about it was um, 
how you didn't get to choose how long you stayed at each performance space, right? You might be like totally engaged. Like there was one part I was like really, really interested in, in the, the particular like dancers and what was happening in where I was facing. And then suddenly I'm taken away. And the next thing I was at, I thought was not interesting and certainly not as interesting as what I've been watching. And so that whole idea of, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out is true. It's not fear, it's knowledge. You are missing out like that other performance that was fantastic and much more interesting and deliberately more interesting. Some are deliberately more interesting than others. So another, uh, another, um, uh, kind of uh, inspiration is this me meta movie project. Active movies set inside the virtual reality metaverse. And um, I am gonna play the audio uh, for this and um, maybe go, go big, big screen for it so you can see a little bit better. So this is Jason Moore and he came up with this really fascinating, ambitious project, the meta movie, uh, yeah, meta movie project. And he um, did this in the virtual world, High Fidelity, which does persist as an open source project, but the company itself has stopped uh, developing it. Um, I think unfortunate timing because uh, I think people could have used it on desktop, which is uh, actually how we're proceeding with our like multiplayer uh, experience for um, the project that, that we're working on, where most people are going to access it on a desktop, um, and uh, they'll uh, there's also you know a quest build uh, for the performers, and at some point we may be able to release that for other people as well. Okay, so this is another one of our meta movies are influenced by interactive theater, video games, cinema, and role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. But you know what? Instead of just sitting here talking about VR and the metaverse, let's go inside and I'll show you around. Okay, now we're in the metaverse, an emerging community of virtual worlds all connected together by the internet. I'm wearing my bulldog avatar and I'm walking down Main Street in New New York. Now to you, this just looks like a two-dimensional video game. But to me, wearing my VR gear, I'm completely immersed in this world and it's amazing. Unlike a traditional movie, a meta movie is not recorded and played back. A meta movie is performed live with a cast of live actors who are all using their own VR rigs in their homes or their office to perform together in the same virtual place in real time. This allows the audience, we call them the VIP, to participate in something wildly unique, a completely immersive, totally interactive, cinematic experience from inside the world of the story. Now, when you're the VIP, you're given a character, a role to play, and the story unfolds around you. You can say or do anything you want because our actors are trained in improvisational theater, so whatever you've got, we're ready for it. If you've ever seen HBO's Westworld, you'll have an idea about what I'm talking about. An experience that puts you, the VIP, right in the middle of the story. Okay, I'm going to skip just so you can see what it looks like. <laughs> it's kind of a funny place to land. Okay. Robber and the undercover cop trying to take him down. After months of rehearsals, I'm excited to announce that we are ready to begin live performances. With your support, we can continue to run the heist throughout 2019 so that as many people as possible can experience it. But that's not all. If we hit our funding goal, we will create two more meta movies this year. A okay, supernatural. So that that is that this is the you know like the 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 funding uh, uh, you know video of it. Let me go back to here, and then the final um, final thing is is last last year's uh, project uh, a little video from last year's uh, version of the project from uh, Nona Hendricks with last year's uh, electron production design class. Oh, I see. I see what I've done. <laughs> okay. Please let me write about it. Light sticks. 
Okay, so that that is a was a very very short short clip of it, but I hope that what you can see, let me go back. Here we go. I hope that what you could whoops. I hope that what you could see um, uh, showed that uh, the the project that we did last year we um, uh, just uh, performed in a pretty small space. We don't have a like a good black box uh, theater space that, that we could use. And so we did it in just like a pretty small space. And um, uh, we were going to have a much, much bigger space. We were pretty excited to, to use it. And we were, you know, putting up like all kinds of screens and screens and going to project like all around. Our, the plan was for 10 projectors. And in, in the, under the heading of um, turns out, you know, we were worrying about the wrong thing. I was like so worried about how are we gonna do this production with ten projectors, you know, for for, for project projection mapping and ten projectors, and I was just like, I don't see how we're gonna be able to do it with these ten projectors. And I was like so worried about this, but <laughs> no projectors, right? Because we're not in that space. So, you know, I think there's been a lot of war. It turns out a lot of us were worried about the wrong things <laughs> for this spring. <laughs> But it's just something to remember when worrying, I think, in general. So uh, Nona's uh, project, this is the third part of the trilogy. Um, uh, it, hers last year was um, the Digital Forest of Possibilities. This year, the third part is called Dream Machine. And um, uh, where I come into it is I've been working on this prototyping project for how to combine um, live and recorded performance assets with performers who are in person but also remote and with um, using both virtual uh, performance spaces and uh, actual performance spaces and so trying to combine all these different things and a process of having like increasingly uh, complex um, uh, prototypes right so that was like my project for this year from a Berkeley faculty fellowship. And so um, when we had to pivot to online, I was like, ah, <laughs> I do know how to do this, or I have a plan for how to do this. I have an idea for how to do this, but this is like way, way further down the line than where I thought I'd be when I, my plan was for this spring was, you know, can I have, you know, four dancers in quests and then two other people in quests who aren't in the same place, but really we're just gonna be down the hall, you know, kind of thing. I mean, that's like, and then maybe one person who was, you know, in a completely different location. I mean, it was just sort of like a whole different uh, kind of a thing. But this is, um, and I'm not gonna play all the whole of this, but this is, uh, these are the students um, in uh, one of our prototypes that we did in the dance and technology. Oh shoot, I'm sorry, I think I'm still doing audio from that other thing. Oh my goodness, wait. Like, but YouTube will never stop on its own, I guess, is the answer to that. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Okay, so, so the students are actually playing these these uh, they're with uh, their iPhones, well, my iPhone, <laughs> and um, with an app on it. And those are the instruments. And so these are the dancers are discovering how to play their um, how to play their uh, with their their movements and and their bodies in improvisation around some loose uh, loose score that we've uh, we've given them. So potential solutions. Um, I was emboldened by this insight from 1966. And yes, I've put a lot of text on here and I am gonna, I am gonna read it to you, which is, you know, they say, whoops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, I'm just trying to move your faces <laughs> so I can read my text. Thus the happening, so this is from 19, uh, well, this is actually from 19, originally published in 1965. Um, uh, Thus the happening, so you know, Caprow and the idea of happenings, thus the happening developed as an intermedium 
an uncharted land that lies between collage, music, and the theater. It is not governed by rules. Each work determines its own medium and form according to its needs. The concept itself is better understood by what it is not rather than what it is. Approaching it, we are pioneers again, and shall continue to be so as long as there's plenty of elbow room and no neighbors around for a few miles. Well, I read that in this context of social distancing. <laughs> as I say, I was emboldened <laughs> by this. I've been thinking about this. It has different meaning now, of course, than in, in uh, 1966. <laughs> but but in, in thinking about this, that, you know, like what, what does it mean to be pioneers again? What does it mean to think about um, this new kind of space that we need to take up and um, uh, use and, and, and try to, to still create presence, uh, presence in. So I've already talked about this. I'm gonna kind of skip through this. This is um, the, uh, the iPhone, which yes, we use duct tape to stick it onto the dancer's arms. Um, and uh, I already showed you that. These were the three environments I made in Unity for this particular project. So it was like the city, the jungle, the cave, and uh, you know, using using triangles, uh, triangle squares and circles and colors, and you know, trying to think about this as like um, you know, like a, also uh, an exercise in uh, design. Um, the first phase had an, a VR component that one person could be like the live camera. And uh, that was the component that I was gonna bring into Dream Machine, that one of the characters would be able to be um, having this kind of like live camera perspective. And we've been trying to think about that, like how can we use camera? Uh, how can we give the players the ability to switch between first person uh, and uh, bird's eye view, right? How can we give the players what happens if we give the players more than two camera positions to experiment with? What happens if we take the camera position and make it so it's not voluntary, which is in one way something I'm kind of like against, but on the other, I, I think might be kind of interesting uh, in thinking about that, how to moving people between have, being um, like players and spectators, right? Um, and uh, that's still here. Yeah. Phase two was uh, the idea of like the dancer actually controlling the avatar, which we, we got, I got to as like a, a prototype. And then phase three is what we're trying to, to get to with um, networked multiplayer in real time with avatars. We're using norm core for that. Um, remote and co-located dancers. Well, we're all remote. <laughs> and um, I don't think we're able to really, we're gonna use uh, augmented reality. Like where does augmented reality fit into our uses of media right now? I mean, one of the things I'd like to, to introduce as a topic of our conversation when I wrap up here in a few minutes is, you know, where is immersive media in our current media landscape? Why, well, I mean, I know we, we all have, have good answers for this, but you know, let's discuss why this isn't, hasn't been the time when there has been you know, the possibility for XR adoption. I mean, there, there was that great article by Jeremy Balenson in the Wall Street Journal about why Zoom meetings exhaust us so much, right? We're in a new relationship between the three-dimensionality and two-dimensionality. Um, I was, uh, did a lot of like making machinima video and building my own sets and characters uh, in Second Life um, 12 years ago, <laughs> right? And it feels to me like a lot of the technology is exactly where we were then. I mean, that the network capabilities are better and broadband is better. And, you know, there are a lot of things that are like better. I mean, I guess my webcam is better. But in so many ways, we're exactly where we were like on the internet and also kind of the same internet that um, meme uh, speaks to as well, that, uh, that you know, ballet, ballet about the internet. So in terms of like pivots and uh, we um, uh, really working towards, you know, like in my design for the game world and my design for, um, you know, now this like, you know, performance space, the game world becomes the virtual space in which the 
virtual performance uh, takes place. Um, taking some, uh, some lessons from Altspace VR, um, which if only it worked on Mac would be what would be an awesome solution, but Mozilla Hubs is, is very good as well, uh, with maybe different kind of avatars and capabilities. But thinking about like the emojis as a way uh, for participants, for players to um, indicate their affect and to not exactly vote, but to direct the characters kind of like a uh, crowd, crowd, the way the, you know, like when, when people uh, um, uh, go on Twitch and, you know, direct the, the, the players on how to play the game. Uh, uh, right. Okay. So, and then um, thinking about what signals game space versus like digital space and trying to move through different eras of uh, like digital and game space, you know, in terms of an aesthetic. So this kind of like, like 80s, 90s wireframe sort of thing. And then uh, moving into like the Minecraft, the early 2000s Minecraft, and then more into uh, what we have now. Right, improvisation, trying to again, think about this like thumbs up, thumbs down, um, allowing the spectators, we're gonna have spectators and players. So kind of two levels and I'll be able to share all that sign up information once we get our website up and running in the next week or so, in case anybody wants to participate in our, uh, in our uh, dream machine, virtual dream machine uh, project. And um, just thinking about how can we, how can we uh, enable um, people to, uh, how can we create the, the possibility, the framework for, for people to have um, as much possibility for that intermedial perception as possible in what is a pretty limited uh, ability to sort of express and, and almost no ability to actually affect change in the game environment. And then thinking about creating presence however we can. I left this one blank, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And that, that's really where, where I'd like to, to you know, have our conversation uh, go. Right? How how do we create presence when um, we are are so aware? I think right now of uh, the distance be, um, between us and are being told that there has to be distance between us. And you know, I mean, I think we know as people who understand the the rationally the science and the reasons behind that that it is really important, even as we crave. Uh, you know, closeness and connection. And so what can media do? Why has, um, I have my list of, of these things, you know, like what, why has, has um, uh, VR been not possible? I mean, well, of course, nobody can actually even buy the headsets if, if they wanted to, if they could afford them, they, they still can't buy them. Um, the, the same way, I think, or like in a parallel way that, um, a friend of mine who's a, an, an architect who made science and um, uh, medical buildings who uh, all the the protections for like like how do you deal with like you know most dangerous viruses was about how do we protect them in like the lab you know and create these like like you know super secure safe labs but in fact it's about the personal protection right that's what we actually need and what like people need right now. And um, certainly our lab model, for, like at Berkeley, to make a jump, <laughs> our lab model for VR is about having headsets that are shared. I can't imagine being able to do that, right? I can't imagine after this people wanting to be like, hey, yeah, I just had this headset, this VR headset on my face. Here, why don't you stick it on your face? You know, it's just, you know, that that is not a, a, a possibility. And um, what does it mean to have, you know, like a personal device? What's the, the model, the economic model that'll work for that? So um, I'm going to, these are some of our big, big questions, you know, how do we unite these different mediums artfully in this intermedial way? Um, what, what it, is it going to be like for the performers and the audiences, right? How do we mix all these realities? And let's discuss. So I'll stop sharing. 
and I'll stop, I've stopped sharing. <laughs> so Sarah, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. I did that abruptly, I'm sorry about that, but I wanna to get to the discussion. I'm, uh, I'm super interested to hear what, uh, what people at the, at the Open Doc Lab have to say. Wonderful, thank you, Lori. So uh, if you wanna ask a question, anyone in the audience, just put it in the Q&A or in the chat, and I will read those questions out loud. Um, in the meantime, do we have any questions from the panelists? Looks like we have a couple of raised hands from in the participant section. Okay, great. Let me get to that. Do you want to read them out, Claudia? Um, Ruth, do you still have a question? Yes, I had a question about the app that she used on the wrists of her students. Is that an app that they designed in the class or is it an app that I can use? It, um, it was an app. So uh, there were two, two students um, who uh, are in the, the Dream Machine class now um, uh, who uh, approached me about wanting to, to work, work uh, with me on uh, how, however it was at, at some lecture I gave that <laughs> about like some crazy, what my crazy prototype ideas, you know, they're like, oh, can we, can we, can we do something with you? I was like, yes, you can. That's the way this works. <laughs> you come up to me and yes. You can. And so um, I'll have to look it up. It's on my phone, but what the instruments were what the students made, like the app uses the accelerometer but the, um, the instruments, the musical instruments, the electronic instruments for what the, the students made those. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll, Ruth, I'll get that to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Any other questions? Anyone? Thoughts, comments? Not seeing any in Q and A. Do you, do you wish, do you wish we, we were in the, all in VR right now? Yes or no? No, why not? Hi, Lori. It's Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Awesome presentation. Great to see you. Good to see you. Um, you know, I've been having a lot of the same thoughts. I have an Oculus Go and a Quest that I brought home from our lab, and my gamer husband has not touched it and instead is playing playing videos, really interactive videos, um, really uh, agency focused type of games over his computer. And it kind of boggles my mind because I have a quest. <laughs> and so if, I, if, if he's not doing that, and if I have been spending most of my professional time training people on how to use Zoom, people who I thought would be much more technologically advanced than they are, it gives me a lot of pause about where we're at in the VR space. Because maybe we're not, it's, we're, we don't have the capacity as a culture yet to really adopt VR, just given the hurdles that we've had to get through over the last five weeks. So just thought I'd throw that out there for discussion as you yeah. raised as well. You know, I, I I've been I've been thinking about that a lot, and and I actually had this um, I actually had an ex experience in uh, I guess it was not this March, but a year ago March, um, when I was in uh, San Francisco for GDC, and oh no, May it must not have been March, it must have been in the fall. Well, anyway, it was right before uh, high fidelity, um, you know, stopped right, and and uh, stopped you know like the the VR uh, their VR part of their journey. And um, I had a meeting set up with uh, uh, Philip Rosedale and like in my, in my notebook, I had my plan basically for, you know, metaverse university, right? <laughs> and so I was like, I, yeah, I must've been in the fall. And so, uh, so I um, was like about to like pitch it and he was just really different than I had ever seen him before. And you know, a couple weeks later when High Fidelity made that announcement, then I understood why. And he was saying, maybe we were just too soon. Maybe we're just too soon. Why aren't there headsets? Why do, don't people have headsets? Why, why hasn't this happened yet? And, you know, I mean, like everybody here at the company is having a great time, but, 
you know, and you're having a great time, but nothing is, is happening, you know, on the scale that I would have expected it to, you know, I would have predicted that there would have been, you know, however many headsets. And I just like shut my notebook and, and, you know, like listened, listened to him and uh, really thought about that. And it, kind of surprised me, you know, well, not kind of, it like shocked me and freaked me out, <laughs> but, but, you know, like he, he, obviously he wasn't wrong. And I've continued to think about that, you know, I mean, this was like a, a moment where I thought I was going to, you know, make this big pitch about, well, you know, the, and I still think this is true that the way to build the metaverse would be to have um, the, have, you know, people who are learning about it, build it, you know, like, like the project for, for building it would be to build it and you would learn how to build it by building it you know like it's the it's the <laughs> it's the lego approach but but um but it pe right. people don't want to have it yeah um hey, russ i think that the this is a kind of a, a wake-up call for everybody that's in the field um but should have we should have seen it coming um you mentioned the gaming part less than 1% of Steam users use a headset. Yeah. Less than 1%. And that's the gamers. So you can imagine what that translates to non-gamers, which is zero. Yeah. Essentially, if it's not a demonstration being run by someone in the field, it's not happening. So the idea of too early is, um, is almost an understatement. Um, we ourselves have, I think, realized it is the future. The difficulty about predicting the future is not what the future will be, but when it will occur. And I think we've greatly miss, missed this idea of when all this is going to be possible. Um, so I think now we have to back up and think about how do we not so much push the technology, which is not ready, but how do we communicate the deeper ideas that we've learned so that they at least begin to stick with people um, and they don't lose the notion that there is a future out there. It's just not here yet. Yeah, and Russ, I mean, I remember, um, you know, one of the first times that I really thought about that idea of like too soon was a presentation that you gave at, um, I think it was like at, we were at Harvard School of Ed, Graduate School of Ed, a, like a long, a long time ago. And you were talking about like different timelines and then we were talking afterwards and and, um, and we were talking about like television, you know, like when does television come in and how does that happen? And really thinking about that, like from our media history perspective. And, and uh, it, you know, even then it seemed to me, well, it'll just be next year or whatever. And then as, you know, it just, it just isn't. And, and then so many people I think are discovering for the first time how like this kind of thing can make them feel connected to people, you know, and these like family Zoom meetings means, you know, that, that it's, it's like it, because it's, it's the only conduit we have, you know, and maybe. One of the reasons it's working is that people have the technology. Hmm. Um, and I think one of the things that occurred to me recently was that we had gone through this stage of at the very beginning of VR um, using phones in cardboard. Um, I'm now beginning to think that moving away from that was a bad idea. And in fact, that this is not going to work unless it will work on your phone. Yeah. Because your phone is the ubiquitous technology. If you want the solution to go ubiquitous, you have to use a technology that's already there. So I've actually been looking at the fact that five, six, seven years later now, the phones are a whole lot better. And if you go backwards and put a brand new iPhone 11 into a cardboard, it's actually as good as a Quest. Yeah. That's a really interesting notion, which is by adding something that costs a dollar to a phone, you might actually be able to get a larger uptick than all of this sort of, you know, every three month, six month evolution out of the headset industry itself. Yeah, I was just looking. I've got these little, those little homey uh, Yeah, right. The homey you know, yeah. yeah, those just those little things that you clip on, and I usually have them just like right here on my my desk. But uh, oh, actually, I've got I've got some other another pair of, of these. But I mean, I think that that like just just like these, I got the, I got these somewhere. I don't, <laughs> they're super patriotic. <laughs> but just you know, the idea, right? That that you can just you can just like clip 
clip something like that on, you know, and then that's, that's, that gives you enough. I mean, that's, that was, that was really good in my classes. And that was really good in, you know. 80% of what you would be getting with an experience for a thousand dollar headset. Um, yeah. Difference of quality is offset by the notion of, of um, quality of experience. And you'd rather have a great experience on those viewing situation than a poor experience with a better headset. Yeah, so, well, Kathy, Kathy says in the chat, she said, we need AR, VR glasses, not headsets. And then that, that does raise like that, that whole idea of, um, of uh, AR as well. And yeah. that, that seems to be like missing. And um, there, there's also another, another uh, comment here from uh, someone that I went, with whom I went to high school, Scott Mainwaring, who is like one of the smartest people I know. I think presence is so important. There's no way for performers or just speakers to feel how audience is reacting. When I was at Interval Research Corporation, we were experimenting with audio only media spaces. Yeah, which were able to give about eight people or so the feeling of being in a shared space. Have you seen recent work focusing on the audio aspect of VR, AR rather than the visual? That's a really good question. When, what, I wonder what, what people have to say about all of, yeah, all of those. You could combine, say, the quality of the um, earbuds from Apple with a, um, an inexpensive either glasses or a cardboard solution, you're actually getting close to something that's usable. And you can stop talking about the technology and go back to the content. Great, we have a question here um, from the audience um, that's been here for a while. Your work inspires thinking of how our audio gesture visual language could be evolving. Lanier's vision for VR was a new language, a new way of communicating. Most virtual spaces I've visited replicate the real world, but digital offers us affordances to go beyond the messes and introduce new forms of exchange. Um, what might those be? What experiments might be fruitful right now? Oh, David, that's a, uh, your, your uh, question um, that raises like so many areas that, that uh, I'm interested in and, and trying to like work with in this uh, Dream Machine project. Um, you know, first of all, like getting away from those mimetic spaces, I think is, is really important and, you know, like, and, and actually this connects to, to Scott's question as well about um, having like the, uh, the audio first. And so for this, this Dream Machine project, it's created by musicians and um, the idea is that it is like an audio, audio scape, a soundscape, and that the, um, it's not like an opera, but the, the, the narrative is, is driven by, by audio and the story and the interactions. And so, you know, to be thinking about what, what is like the minimum visual, that's the way I've been thinking about it. What's the minimum like visual representation that you need in, in a digital environment? And I was actually thinking about that in terms of the projections in the physical space as well. And, you know, like what, what is like this very like minimal uh, suggest, suggesting something that is filled in by the audio. And so um, for, for me, uh, audio, one of the things that's exhausting about Zoom is that the audio just comes from that, this one place. And also that we're all in this like medium close up. It just drives me crazy, <laughs> right? You know, no matter, no, 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 Kathy, you don't have to move. It's just that, that like, like why, 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 right? You know, why are we all in the same camera position, right? And nobody's moving and it's just like, you know, it's like, like uh, it's messing with my idea of what like that visual language of like you know cinema should be. But anyway, but but you know like the, when we put those things together, we start thinking about what it means to be in a three-dimensional, three-sixty environment. Then once we have like that spatial audio, then that changes it. Even if what you see is coming from the front because that's what, what we see. We don't see what's behind us, right? We see what's in front of us, but we always hear in this 360 uh, uh, you know, way. We always hear in an immersive way. And so when the audio can be like that and all you need is headphones or earbuds or just you know, anything, anything like close to your head, right? So I, I think that that's a, a really, um, uh, that would be a really interesting experiment 
right? And bows with their, uh, their sunglasses, you know, with that, that are audio and not visual. Like that's a really interesting experiment. But then they didn't know what to do with it, it seems to me. They were asking people to make games for the phone, right? When um, the, the idea of, of something that, well, we can't be out in the world in the same way, but, but right now, but we will be, you know, but that idea of like having um, these like guided tours, you know, or guided experiences that maybe are, um, you know, like overlay something imaginative and fantastic and, and evocative over our actual spaces, you know, using like Mapbox and some of uh, those uh, kind of things. Great. William has a question. Yeah, first, Laurie, thank you so much. It was a really, a really provocative and um, uh, really making my brain work uh, oh, extra hard. So thanks for that. Um, and I guess, I guess it's a comment and maybe a question, but the comment is, I think we've become victims. Our, we, our, our imaginary has been captured by corporate technology. And we're thinking through these systems. So what's, why have we forgotten about the history of earlier media forms and how they evolve and when they can take off? Stabilization of the technology is crucial. We saw that with television. It could have been around at the end of the 19th century, started the 20th. It took until after the war. And it was about incompatibility of systems. And it was about a kind of the heavy hand of corporations like RCA that were tweaking it. Well, now with, you know, with HTC and, and, and Oculus as the definers of a technology and gaming us rather than letting us kind of think through what the medium can do. For me, I, I, I'm a little pessimistic about VR in a way that I'm less pessimistic about AR. Not AR as a technology, but but augmentation as a principle. So the the audio augmentation that you were just referring to with the Bose frames, or the projection that the Canadians, the the, the Montreal people have been so good with, with Aura, or with mm -hmm. uh, City Memoir, where you're able to re rearticulate public spaces, you're able to sort of inscribe people in part of a huge narrative that technologically speaking requires not too much. I mean, that's the, the Epson projectors have dropped to near nothing and magic is possible and it's something that all of us can participate in. But if we imagine AR as goggles or whatever this latest, this proprietary junk is that's on the market right now, it's, it's also gonna be set back forever. So just an appeal to, I mean, it's all stuff that's been said uh, now, but, but I think this idea of embracing the principles, the concepts behind these things and forgetting about the technology. The technology is, has in, in fact proving to be a real barrier. Um, mm, I think that's a I think that's a really good point. So one of the things that um, Nona Hendricks and I are are working towards, and uh, you know, like we feel like we were pushed off a cliff <laughs> with <laughs> trying to make this this performance into something that can be online in a couple weeks, you know. And um, but we're working towards the idea of like a center for augmented performance, you know, and we, we, we really think of it that way. We don't want to, you know, and, and you know, like you're, you're, uh, what you're talking about, like with projection in a space that transforms a space uh, and then has this, is in this immersive uh, way that you are in the middle of it, but not because it's something that is overwhelming or that has replaced your uh, per sensory perception. And the idea that intermedial um, focus on perception is that you still have your perception. And I, I, I like the way that you said that because the technology is trying to overwhelm our perception. It's trying to kind of hijack our perception. I mean, that, that I think is the, you know, the, the model for the current headsets. And, um, uh, and Russ's point about the phone is really important. That still is the, that is the way that, um, for you know, some of my students who don't have the same kind of access to technology as some other students do, they have a phone, you know? Like that's the thing that, that everybody has in, in uh, countries all over the world where people don't have other things. You know, and that idea of like, what, how can we do that? And the, the phone as the augmented reality device, right? Where it's not like some crazy other headset that is another thing that costs thousands of dollars, but it is it is being driven by by the the, the companies, by the corporations. I'm curious about what's going to happen with Facebook Horizons. That's the one that I've really been keeping my eye on. When I uh, 
presented um, uh, last year, maybe, I don't know. All my, all my sense of time is all messed up. <laughs> People keep talking about that, it's the other thing. But um, uh, uh, at, uh, at MIT, and I was talking about virtual worlds, I showed a commercial, like an early ad for, for Horizons, and it was like this super domestic thing. Like it could have been ripped out of the 1950s, except it was, you know, 1950s, like adopt television, except it was adopt Facebook, you know, Facebook horizons for you and your girlfriends, you know, married women with your husband in the background. You know, it was like this really strange thing. So I'm very curious to see what happens. They must be racing to, to get that, that going and to have the headsets to, to, to mount it. But that's, I think that's the one to kind of watch. I have a question. Um, so, so uh, first of all, thank you for, for the presentation and, and it's good to see you again. Good to see <laughs> you too. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I've been thinking, yeah, about a bunch of the comments that were made and uh, what you said. And um, I also, right, I also have, you know, an Oculus Rift and a Quest here in the studio. And I've, I was thinking about how I was kind of, shocked at how almost like averse I was to even touching those in this period in particular, even though I have some projects I've been using them for and all that, but it's just like there is an actual almost like repulsion from that. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that all of those experiences are very unmoored from reality and really in their own kind of bubbles. So it's multiple bubbles. It's the bubble of privilege of even having that kind of technology and then the kind of actual separation that it involves that you know uh being in most of these experiences even the ones that are social they're like there's this weirdness to them because it's kind of like a more vulnerable version of like the old school kind of internet anonymous ch chat rooms or whatever right it's kind of a weird so to me what you're doing or this idea of an actual collaboration right kind of like what's happening here but i mean something that's anchored in the real world and something that's anchored in uh, human connection and collaboration is maybe the way, more of the way forward with some of these tools because um, then you're anchored to something real, right? And then you're not, it's not like a tool of further kind of corporate fragmentation of reality, but it's actually kind of expanding or anchored in, um, you know, human experience that doesn't have to do with a particular technology or a particular, uh, so more of these kind of systems of improvisation or collaboration, like I think there's a lot to be learned from anyone like dancers and musicians and anyone that does these kind of practices of listening and collaboration um, in kind of maybe pushing these things forward in a constructive way. Um, I don't know, there's not an exact question in there. It's more like a comment or I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I I guess one of the things that like from working with with dancers over this past like year and a little bit that um, uh, really I've been thinking about a lot is um, this idea of just like the physicality of it, you know, in this time when we're not supposed to like be near each other, <laughs> you know, and and just like watching like the 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 video from uh, last year's you know uh, digital forest and and having the dancers you, you, like like you know ah, touch somebody's hand <laughs> take them by the hand and move them around and that that was that was what our plan was for um for what we were going to do uh the, the space is Fordham Road it's our our rehearsal space and you know in Austin but you know it's like that's what we were going to do like in our our uh, in on location performance with you know like this unity game scene on the walls, right? And other stuff on the walls, the connect wall and everything. And so when, um, when we were thinking about that, we were like, okay, we're gonna have, we've got this one character, the timekeeper. And so like, who's like the master of ceremonies, DJ, D, D, now based on DJ, you know, D nice, right? right? <laughs> but, but it was originally more like a, like a um, from a Moulin Rouge Ziggler, that's who it was in my head at least, you know, but, uh, but, um, uh, so, you know, like the, the DJ D nice is, you know, telling people, you know, was, go, go here or go there. But now it's like, what does that even mean in this context? Like go here or go there, you know, or you all come over in this space and be together here. Or maybe that's what we want to do as like virtual little, the, the players are like little capsule avatars, you know, but, but like as like capsule avatars that you can see yourself from like the bird's eye view and where you are. 
So like I'm thinking of it as like you're kind of like um, like particles in a particle system. If if we if it's massively multiplayer enough to look like a particle system, then you know like how do you move yourself around and you're part of something that's like a collective, but also you're still like an individual. And you know what is that? I mean like that's part of this kind of like intermedial perception and you know, like, like thinking through some of those kinds of things that working with dancers has, has um, made me think of like even more so. And, and that is not like a gamer kind of way to think, you know? And that's not a game design way to think. And it's not like a design of VR experience way to think. And, I, I, that, that, and it's not just about the body, but it's about the, the, the person and others. And um, I guess I'll stop there. That sentence didn't really stop, but. Andrea, you had a question? Yeah, um, so I'm really interested in how broader groups of researchers can learn from these experimentations happening in, with performers. Um, just last week, I saw this live broadcast um, of an open rehearsal of a social VR piece where you know, a director was directing actors with their v VR headsets and you could kind of see like the dynamics at play. Like you see the actors with their headset on and also the screen of what, you know, we're watching. So I thought that broadcast was just really, I learned a lot from it. And so I'm wondering what are your thoughts in regards to, you know, documentation of process and, and um, even if the technology and the performances themselves might not be accessible, what can we learn from process? Oh, that's a really good question. I've been, you know, like, I, I think I'm, I'm like more interested in the process and I think of it as a process and um, my focus on uh, prototyping is like, I don't even, I don't think of anything as like the final thing. It's just another prototype, right? You know, <laughs> and like, where, where is, what is that final I don't even know what that final thing is. It doesn't. It doesn't even exist yet. So, so in terms of the documentation, it, it becomes a, a question of um, what what is what can how can you document things in a way that is useful for others? And so I I don't know. I mean I'm trying to I do a lot of like screen capture, and um, I have like notebook after notebook of uh, my own like handwritten draw, you know, drawings and sketches and, and that kind of thing. But then as a team, we're using Slack. And I, I do think that is a, a good way of, of documenting, right? We're using Slack for people to put in their ideas, um, for people to put in their screen captures of like the newest thing that they have made. Uh, in terms of like the actual rehearsals, I think that'll have to be like screen capture as well. And then I mean, what, what do you think? Like, what, what do you think would be like useful for you? What would be a good like format? I guess uh, I, the only thing I really saw was the live broadcast, um, which I thought was innovative in, a, in, a, in and of itself to do something like that in real time. So I guess was that would on, be- the Was it on Twitch or like, where was it? It was uh, from, uh, presented by La Mama, experimental theater group and culture hub and they're I think they're developing kind of a software to enable those kinds of live oh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah that idea of like what's happening um you know that mixed realities that mixed reality capture right is you know for what you're talking about it sounds like because if they're in VR headsets and then we're also seeing what's in the virtual world, the game world, and we're seeing what the performers are doing. I mean, like, that's really fascinating. So we have, you know, we've got these Mimu, Mimu gloves and um, then the Oculus hands, right? And so I'm trying to get those two things to map together. Not easy. <laughs> not the same thing, because the Mimu is not positional, right? I mean, it's not spatialized, not positional. And um, uh, so, so we're seeing, and so like one of the early ideas that I had was, okay, so we have like webcam live feed going into Unity. I've done that before. And um, the character of the person who's using the Mimu gloves has a screen for a body. And on the, bot, on the screen, we see the live feed of what they're doing. I mean, I think there'll be latency. And so we might have to fake it. But, oh, that's the other thing that is big in this project. 
uh, which I didn't mention, which is like, what has to be, and this has always been part of this project, what has to be live and what doesn't have to be live, right? And that's a huge thing with any kind of thing to do with performance and technology. Like what, what really does have to be live? Because anything that's live can go wrong and anything that's live uh, has latency. Everything has latency. And so um, the things that have to be live have to either be for the performer or for the audience. And if it's for the audience, it has to be about cause and effect, right? So that, that like they understand that there's a live person who's controlling something rather than this is just a recording. For the player, it has to be, I'm affecting something and I can see, I can see the cause and effect that I have agency in this world, I can affect change in this world, right? And, or something is happening because of what, what I'm doing, my difference, this is a meaning, this is meaningful, right? And so thinking about all those things and then trying to make everything else like recorded and faking cause and effect whenever possible, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, a lot of it is, tri is tri trickery, right? And, 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 um, but you just have to, have to do that. And there have been a lot of things that like I've done in previous projects, other people who I you know, talk, uh, who, um, where you just like do the most complicated things that are live um, and nobody can tell. Nobody even knows that that's what happened. And, you know, you, you like just, just <laughs> you just, it, you, you just like kill yourself to try to make this thing happen live and it does, nobody even knows that it happened. So like you want to do the showiest things and sometimes, you know, like wh what is that? And so I think what you're talking about is actually like, how do you show things that matter, right? And document the things that matter for people who to see. And then the other documentation, like the technical documentation, isn't anything you can necessarily see, but make this project happen has to be able to look up a hot person, you know, do this thing. But that isn't something that someone wants to watch a video of because, you know, you just like, just like bang your head on the desk, too boring. But in terms of those things you describe, like choosing which objects and interactions are live, I feel like are really, you know, profound questions. And, and like understanding that process will help people also understand, you know, the the digital infrastructures that are kind of guiding it. Yes, yeah, that's a really good point. So one of the things that is um, like helpful and kind of awesome about this project uh, is that, um, you know, it's like known as, uh, known as um, big, big uh, ideas, has sort of like a Zen Buddhist narrative content of it uh, and and um so like it's about transformation and it's about becoming and it's about finding a true voice and it's about um like the character i play is the villain <laughs> i've never played a villain but it's i'm sort of interested you know and so the villain the villain is called head, but the head is also like the media, you know, and, and like the media, everything that the media tells us to be, or at least that's how this media studies person <laughs> chooses to think about it. And, and, you know, so, so it has to do with all of um, like the, those parts of it. And so that helps um, me in thinking narrative and the game objects in which interactions matter because there's uh, like a philosophical um, and uh, narrative uh, uh, there's there that has to be served, you know. I mean, like there, like that, like that has that comes up here, and then the technical. Yeah, there's always the technical choices, but like the most important thing are those like philosophical, narrative, aesthetic choices. Figure out how we make that happen as best we can. And then when it actually comes down to like making something happen, that we just do whatever we can, right? You know, like in, in, in prototype, iterate. If I can- I'd love to know that link that you were talking about, that, and if you could share that. Doesn't have to be right now, but. 
If I can just, hi, Lori. Um, Yay! <laughs> it's my friend and colleague, <laughs> um, Rachel. Mm -hmm. If I can just add to the, the conversation about um, what to do live and what not to do live, there's mm, also, sure. I've been grappling with that um, as long as I've been doing, you know, computer music and electronic music. And um, when, when you're figuring out what you're going to do live and what you're, you're not going to do live, you also have to figure out a way to communicate what is live and what is not live to multiple audiences in the room or in the virtual space. Um, because I, I just remember the first time Carl, my partner, came to one of my shows, um, I like did all live electronics, everything was processed and, um, you know, I sat at a laptop and I just, I did it on the laptop and I did it. And I think that any person with my extremely narrow background would have heard that it was live and heard that it was um, totally live processed. But he was like, that was really boring that you just sat there. Um, which I think that's a pretty narrow, you know, thing for you to think. But because he's not a, a professional electroacoustic musician, Halsey's laughing at this. Yes. So um, when you when you are doing something live um, and you're putting all of this energy into making sure that it is live, you have to figure out cues for um, for a general audience. It, there's no such thing as general audience, right? But just rhetorically, let's just say um, that you need to figure out cues about how it's going to be live process. Uh, you, you need to figure out cues about the liveness for those who aren't used to the liveness that you're going to be offering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chagall is um, so so this 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 like game thing that happens like uh, ends triumphantly, right? <laughs> right, no, no, infinitely with a performance by Chagall, right? And so, um, uh, so she, she has, she is uh, really fantastic about um, performing, like the performative aspect of liveness, because the, one of the things that the Mimu gloves is good for is showing, like, like making, making what the electronic musician is doing into a gesture that is a performance, you know, it makes it performative so that anybody can see it. And it, instead of being like, you know, with like a key or like a, you know, a fader or any of the things that you're talking about that electronic musicians are, are dealing with that is, you know, it's as interesting as watching somebody, you know, type. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we need to, we need to make it like that. Right. And so then she, she not only uses the gloves, but she uses um, like, uh, there's one thing when she was describing what she did, she's like, oh yeah, well I control that. I control that baseline with my head. Like what? And she's got like all this like long blonde hair and she goes with this big, this ponytail. It's like fantastic, you know, I mean like that, who doesn't want to watch that, you know, I mean like, and then, and listen, and then she sings and, you know, it's like everything all together. And she uses her, her, her body and the choreography that her choreographer has uh, created for her that she's collaborated on to, um, you know, perform. She also when she performs live, she sometimes has a band and then it becomes a question of like, what is she doing versus what is her band doing and tr trying to make that clear for uh, her audience as well. And um, when she was at, at Berkeley and we were all talking about this, this was another one. This has been like the, the big question for this year. We, um, we had a symposium uh, in um, the dance division uh, that was like moving realities. And this ended up being like our big question about, you know, like when, wh what, what has to show and what does not and how do you show it when you're performing with technology as a dancer? You know, like what, what is that? What parts of it? And um, that idea of the general audience is a real, like, like some people, um, like Imogen Heap, when she, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen her perform, but when she uses the Mimi gloves, she basically gives you like a little lesson in how they work. And she shows you how she builds the song. Uh, David Byrne in um, American Utopia, he did a similar kind of thing where he actually 
like shows you what how he how the song is like layered and what everybody is doing and why the technology that they're using with these like wireless mics and everything is really really impressive because otherwise you you might not know that like what why should anybody know any of this i mean i think that's that respects the audience if you go into it as like you know why nobody's born with this and like those of us who know these things we've acquired some really weird you know specific expertise <laughs> I was just going to jump in on that. Um, hi, thank you for the for the wonderful presentation. Hi, hi. I'm, I'm, my name is Pat. I'm in Toronto, and I'm curious to learn more about um, exactly that. How you know how much does uh, you know? You're the expert. Your 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 incredible uses of these technologies. You need to learn how to communicate what's going on in the performance in order to pe for people to be able to read it, feel it, experience it. How much are you learning from? your participants, your audiences, your users in terms of, uh, you know, coming together to have a meaningful experience and how much, how, how um, wanting are users of story in this kind of work? Yeah, so um, I guess like the ideal, right, is that um, someone would enjoy it if uh, they didn't know there was any technology involved at all, right, right, so, so all, but that's that's one way of thinking about it. The other way of thinking about it is you have this is for the people who like technology, right? I mean, I think they're like you know it can go in in either of those ways. But I like to think of it as you know you you even if you even if it was happening by magic, <laughs> right? That it would still be something that it would be like enjoyable and meaningful, so that you don't need any specialized knowledge. Um, if, how however, do you evaluate you, that? How, how do you evaluate those experiences, I guess, for you as a maker in terms of connecting with, with that kind of general audience? Um, I try, I guess I try to, I just, I guess I try to imagine that um, I don't, <laughs> I guess I try to imagine I don't know anything and I find that to be not that <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> I mean, but I, I mean, like, you know, I, I do, I try, I try to imagine, uh, you know, that, that uh, I'm entering into it. Although, of course, people who make things are the worst, you know, play testers and the worst, right? You know, I mean, like famously so. Uh, then you do actually have to ask people and listen when they say that they don't like it and they don't get it, which is which is hard. So I think they're like one of the things that I feel like I'm suffering from this particular, you know in this time period is not having good access, as good access to people to run things by as I would if like I was, <laughs> if people to stop in the corridors or, you know, like there was someone like next door to me that I could just be like, hey, look at this kind of thing. But um, I think, uh, I think uh, that like one, one thing is, um, I think of like, uh, you know, to use a VR example, like Beat Saber, right, for people who've played Beat Saber, the VR uh, rhythm game, right, that has um, like the least amount of instructions and onboarding of pretty much anything else I know of, right? I mean, like you pick that up and okay, I didn't know that like th what the arrows did and someone actually had to explain to me why I was losing all the time, but but you pick it up and you know what to do. You know what a lightsaber is, you know, and you understand like what, what you're supposed to do that you want to like cut stuff with it or whatever and that there's some sort of rhythm element because there's music. And so like to try to get to the point where you don't need instructions, it's, I think it's hard. Or you build the instructions in, which is what we're trying to do with this idea of like a master of ceremonies, you know, DJ character who's telling everybody do this and come over here and, you know, let's all do this and jump now and, you know, like that, that kind of thing. And, you know, I guess we'll see, right? You know, it's an experiment and then maybe we'll do better next time on <laughs> the prototype. But I, it's, it, it is, it is very, it is very, very hard except to try to, you know, like in rehearsal, I think we'll, we'll get a lot of information. And then um, taking out everything, el everything else that doesn't work, I think it's like heartbreaking, but also like we're at the point now where we're just like, lose that, lose, let's take this out, forget that. That was such a good idea, but forget it because it doesn't make sense to anybody, you know? 
So I guess um, uh, try to go simple, maybe. Great, we have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, this is a great presentation. Two questions. What are some of the reasons you believe these technologies have not been incorporated by the general public? And two, why do you think these technologies haven't evolved as much as you might have expected since 1996? Thank you. Uh, those are really good questions. So, um, well, the first one I think is uh, the, the headsets are still, like the VR headsets um, are still like too heavy and too big and too expensive, right? And with the Oculus Quest, which is probably getting close to a price point and, a, and comfortable enough and easy enough to use. I mean, once you set it up, which is fast, I had to set up like so many of them, <laughs> you know, like I had to set up like, like eight in, you know, like, like eight, in in like you know like an hour and 10 minutes or something i can't remember what it was but i had to like go like through all of them and you know it's it's like it's surprisingly streamlined and they do work they work pretty well and um you know i think that they that 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 is that device is kind of getting there but um uh you can't even buy them right you know like they, they're not for sale anywhere they 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 they're not in stock right so so like, you know, like there's that, that problem with it, but um, uh, people don't like ha not being able to see. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? I mean, but like that makes people uncomfortable. People think they look weird. Um, uh, it makes them, you know, feel uncomfortable. They don't know what they look like, you know, with this like weird big thing on their heads. So uh, like, I think there's like a lot about that part of it. Um, the whole Google Glass like debacle set set the wearing the thing on the wearables back like that was had such a negative um, response from people. I mean, I'm I still am surprised that it was that much, and it was about the camera. So like all these issues about privacy, you know, like um, like the portal, you know, like the, the that portal device by Facebook, the can't like the 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 camera on that. Like the way that it follows you around um, is superior to what we have with Zoom and a webcam. Like it really is. I mean, it's like way better. You know, you can move around, and it 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 it's like a much more natural way to be on video chat, right? But people don't necessarily want to have you know have questions about what's Facebook doing with my data and what's happening with this? And, you know, so like there are all kinds of like, like boundaries and, and uh, obstacles to it. Um, uh, so I think that's it. People also like, you know, what are they going to do with these headsets? Right? <laughs> like there still isn't, isn't enough to do with them to make it clear what they could do with it. Uh, and so I think that's another reason why they haven't been adopted. Opted. Like what, you know, what would you like do with it in what, for what VR is actually good for? I don't think it, that it is like about um, gaming, like maybe gaming will be a small percentage of what we could use immersive media for. So like, I think there are all of those reasons. And when, you know, Facebook, Oculus decided they were going to push for, for that rather than some of the other possibilities, I think that was like too bad. But maybe they think that's like where it's going to become a viable money maker to you know get back all their investment. I don't know, but but so there's some you know some things like that that I think are uh, are it. And I forgot the second part of the question actually, so I'm sorry. But that was a uh, the second part of the question, and we actually only have one minute left. Oh, okay, so, yeah. Oh. Um, why do you, yeah? Why do you think these technologies haven't evolved as much as you might have expected since nineteen? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, like the real world, right, is pretty good <laughs> as like a three dimensional space, right? So, what 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 do we need that's that's different from that? We don't need a simulation of the real. World. That always kind of sucks right in some way or another so we need we need to be able to really 
bring what is not fully present in physical space, right? So until we can do that in a way that feels present, once there's that ability, I don't think it has to be photorealistic. I mean, some of it has to do with the audio, the spatial audio, and enough, it has to be like, like low enough latency so you feel like somebody is right there with you. It does have to do with the social, like some, like a social application of it. Probably some kind of three-dimensional like Zoom so that people can, can genuinely like gather. I don't know, the, the one thing I'll say uh, um, just to end, there's this show years and years, it's on HBO and it's like about like the future, 40 years in the future. They have this thing that's like the family link and it's the way that people um, communicate. And it's, it's like some sort of theory, it's a kind of portal way of uh, everyone talking together as they go about their, their daily business, which is what's different about Zoom, right? Because you're like stuck. So I think that part of it, like being able to go about your daily business while still being able to be communicating with whomever you want in this ubiquitous way. Like Zoom is not ubiquitous computing. That idea of like being able, ubiquitous digital communication is like the thing that we need. And audio might be it more than video. All right, well, thank you so much, Lori. It's been a wonderful conversation. And thank, thank you to you. all the attendees for participating today. And yeah, thank uh, you. We'll so much. Yes, and we'll we'll sign off until next week. Bye bye.